This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome, everyone. We're very pleased to be here today. Uh, you're going to have um, three of us present to you. I'm going to be your first presenter in this last lecture of the series. Um, so thank you for participating. I'm gonna we're going to each introduce ourselves and our topics, but they'll come together for um, a larger topic of how we can uh, change how our brain works and our cognitive abilities and how that um, might occur with normal aging and, and uh, uh, associated with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So hopefully all three of us will come together and give you a nice view of how this field is, is evolving. Uh, my name is Adam Ghazali. I'm a neurologist here. I'm also a neuroscientist. So I study both how the brain works in healthy younger adults, older adults, and individuals with dementia. And we also try to figure out how we can help it work better. So I'm going to start telling you a little bit about the field and some of my motivations and then tell you about uh, my research on this. So uh, the goals of our research in our lab and a, a lot of other, other folks that are working on this is to integrate scientific approaches to understand how the brain works and how it changes as we get older and if we have a disease such, such as Alzheimer's disease and then to see if we can use training interventions to improve our brains and our cognitive abilities uh, to have higher quality lives. So that's what I want to state as the first point, that one of the things that guides this research is that improving our abilities through targeted training at our brains and, and, and its weaknesses will improve the quality of our lives. Um, for healthy older adults is the topic of my research, but for many individuals this research is a focus and that it will even decrease p potentially the time of onset of dementia. And the reason for this is because we often don't know right away when individuals have dementia. Probably a lot of you are familiar with that. You've been hearing about these topics of how hard it is to diagnose in those earliest stages. So um, you're going to hear a lot more about cognitive reserve, uh, which is the ability of our brains to resist impairment if it's at a high level. So the idea is that the, the pathology, the disease process might still exist but if your brain is stronger, then it will show the effects later and you'll live a, a, a longer, healthier, high quality life. So this type of intervention might not actually change the disease itself, but it'll change how the disease impacts you. So that's, that's the idea. But even independent of that, just for older individuals that feel that their cognitive abilities have declined, and we have a lot of data that that does occur, can we improve these abilities using scientific approaches? So that's the general topic. What I'd like to say is that these are sort of the next two points are the points that specifically guide my research, that if we understand how the brain changes, we should utilize that information to guide the design of how we might make an intervention. So we don't just say, well, this should work. We could have you do math problems or crossword puzzles, but actually using our knowledge about what's changing to guide how we develop tools to help us improve our abilities. The other thing is that we, in our lab, we study brain recordings. We look at how the brain works in real time. And I'm going to give you some idea about how we can use these brain recordings to develop, evaluate, and optimize our training tools as we move throughout this period of time. We're really just at its infancy right now. I think the ideas about what is potential is very exciting. And that's what I hope to give you a taste of as I show you data from our lab. But we're still at the very beginning of figuring out how we can do this in the best way. Here's the research program of my laboratory here at UCSF. So I'd say one part of it 
is just the basic how does it work, it being the brain and its ability to have uh, high de highly detailed memories and attention. We look at the interface of attention and memory and we use these tools, functional MRI, uh, which is really a standard MRI machine, but we could look at how your brain is working while you do memory and attention problems while you're lying in here. EEG, where we can look at the electrical signals of your brain, which gives us a much more real-time view of your brain working. And another tool, transcranial magnetic stimulation, where we could see what brain areas are doing what in a, in a causal way by perturbing them with a magnetic field. Once we understand how the brain leads to behavior, which is really our goal, we ask how it might change as we get older in a healthy way and how it might change in a way that's not so healthy, where you have dementia that decreases your ability to function. And then, which is the focus of what I'm going to tell you about today, we try to use this information about how the brain changes to guide intervention so we can improve cognitive abilities and improve the quality of life. So we have two main focuses in our lab. Pharmacological, you're all very familiar with that, and you're going to hear some more about that today, as well as cognitive training, which is what I'm going to focus on over the next 10 or 15 minutes or so. So I'm going to tell you about some work that we're doing on a lab to look at can we use tools that other companies might have designed and figure out if they really work, and can we design our own based on our research to guide this more effectively. Okay, I'm going to just tell you one fact that basically is the topic of an hour talk. So we don't have that much time, so I'm just going to ask you to accept this. This is largely the work of our lab over the last 10 years. Um, a lot of it coming out just over the last couple of weeks, and some of it has been attracted a lot of attention. Um, but the topic is, and basically the, the statement that I want you to take away is that this is true throughout your life, but as you get older, the impact of distraction is greater and the ability to multitask, to switch between tasks, becomes more and more difficult. A lot of you might say, okay, I get that, I experienced that. Um, it's a very common reported finding, or at least a common reported experience, that when people that are older than 60 or 70 ask to describe how their memory is changing or their cognitive cognition is changing, they say it's harder for me to be at a restaurant and have a conversation. If I'm asked to do too many things at the same time, it's more and more difficult. We show that in our lab, and we also look at the mechanisms that allow that to occur. But what we specifically show is that the impact of multitasking and distraction has a toll on memory, both memory in the very short term, to hold information in mind, even for just a number of seconds, something we call working memory, or longer term memory, holding information over long periods of time. So the ability to, to do this in a high quality way is impacted if you try to do multiple things at the same time and if you're in a highly distractible environment. This occurs for people of all ages, but it certainly seems to get worse as we get older. And so I want to show you this slide over here. Does anyone, can you guess what this might mean, right? So usually I don't have to speak very much when I put this slide up, but just for those of you that might be lucky enough to not know what this is, this is the experience of standing in front of the refrigerator when you had a clear idea of what you wanted to get seven seconds ago, but now you find yourself there with no idea of what you were looking for in the first place. And this is a very common thing for everyone. This gets worse as we get older, and this is what we feel is based largely not on memory per se. We know that we have the ability to remember a single item for seven seconds, but what this is is an interference effect. It's that there are other things going on in your head, there's other things going on in your peripheral, in your environment, maybe you answered a phone call on the way. And so we've been interested in, in following up this phenomena that is so common in understanding the basis of it and seeing if we can help it. Not just because it's frustrating to be at the refrigerator and forget what you're doing there, but because this is reflective of these general glitches in our memory that occur throughout our lives and get worse that affect our performance. And especially when we're asking a high um, degree of performance from ourselves, if we're trying to continue to work or we're traveling, um, that this, these little memory glitches decrease our ability to perform at that really high level, and that's what we're trying to impact. So our first question was, can we improve our visual abilities um, of older adults, and by that we mean healthy 60, 70, and 80-year-olds, and will that lead to better short-term memory and perhaps an improvement in the ability to multitask? So that was our first question that we wanted to follow up on. And so this is an experiment that we did in collaboration with the company Posit Science, who had already done a lot of the work and developed one of these uh, interventions, one of these brain training tools. So we said, okay, well, we're a lab at UCSF. We're 
don't have an affiliation. Let's try to just take one of their training tools and see if it works, see how it works. And so we took this very simple game where you have to look at the directions of these moving dots, see they might spread apart. They're actually moving, these moving lines, excuse me. They might spread apart or contract. And so if this is what you saw, you would say out in. And if you got it right, it would go faster. It might be in in. And it keeps increasing its, its difficulty as you get better over hours. And you play this at home for many hours. And it's embedded in a game, so it's not you know, quite as boring as it would be just doing this again and again. And you do this, and we wanted to see what this would lead to. So we checked in our lab. So what we did was we had the participants in this study come into our laboratory before and after a whole period of time practicing this game. And we had them do another very simple task. Here you would see the direction of moving dots, and a short time later you would see another direction, and you would have to say whether they were the same or different. So it's what we call a perceptual task, just uh, your ability to distinguish things in the environment. And it's different than what uh, our participants were trained on. But what we were really interested in was, is the memory of this better over time? Here they have just a short period of time, a seven second delay. And then is it better when we put an interruption in the middle? Here you have to say whether this swirling dots, so this is how the experiment works, it moves over time. The swirling dots come up in the middle, and you have to say whether it's fast or slow. And we teach you what fast or slow is beforehand. So this interrupts your memory, and this is what we know gets more challenging as we get older. So I'm going to show you, this is how the experiment works. We do, we do brain recordings in our lab. Then this training is done for five weeks at home. And then you come back in the lab. We look at what's going on in your brain and test your performance on this. And this is what we found, just some very basic findings. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. But this green line over here are younger adults, healthy 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, doing the same experiment once. This session one are our older adults that did it the first time. You could see that they're not doing as well than the younger, compared to the younger adults. The yellow is the training group, and the blue is the control group who didn't do any of the training. They just came in before and after the same period of time. And you could see that the training group has improved over this short period of time to the level of the younger adults, which is really quite remarkable in my mind, considering that this was only for you know 12 hours of practice. What we see even more interestingly is that the memory important, so here performance is lower, meaning that the angle is closer between these lines. But the memory performance also improves to the same level as the younger adults after such a short period of training. And you see the control group is not showing any change. Um, if we make it more difficult by using the threshold at the very beginning, we can show that the effect's not there. So it's not, it's not that it's permanently improved. It's just that it's improved compared to what it was before, but not necessarily um, uh, better at, at more difficult levels. But what's interesting is that we th then looked at what's happening inside the brain of one of our participants, as you could see right here. And we could see how the change in their performance was underlied by changes within her brain. And what we found was that, so this is a look of what one participant, of actually the average of our participants' brains before and after. And green is no change. You could see here green is zero. That's the control group. But the training group shows this red. And what this red means that the activity is less after training. It's no different in the group that did not do the training at all. This might seem counterintuitive that the visual activity in your brain is less after training. But this is, what we, this is consistent with what we understand from other studies. And what it means is that you can process the visual information with less resources. In other words, their brains are more efficient at processing the visual information. And what we see here is that there's a direct correlation. So these folks over here did the best on the test compared to how they did before. They showed the most improvement, and they showed the most of this change in their brain. So this is really our goal, to really link together the changes in performance, what allows you to become better with what changes in your brain. You can see the relationship is quite strong. However, when we looked at their memory performance with this interruption, what we found is that there was no improvement. So the training had some benefits, but it had limitations. And this is definitely one of the takeaways, that there's really probably no magic bullet here. We're going to step forward in our lab and others and figure out the pieces that work, and they might work for some people and not others, and that's an important ingredient, to figure out what the weaknesses are and how you might best target them. So you could see, since there was no improvement with the interruption, we asked a new question. Can the ability of older adults to resist interference by distraction and also multitasking result in memory improvement in the setting of interference. 
So we decided to train that directly. And so we invented this video game in our lab called NeuroRacer. And this study is ongoing right now. So I could just give you a little hint at what the data is showing. But what this experiment does is, is that it challenges our older participants with a game that keeps layering on more and more interference to see if we challenge our participants, will they get better at it? And if they get better at dealing with interference in this driving game where they're driving along and these signs come up, will their memory be better? So this is the question we're trying to answer now. And how the experiment works is the same idea. You come into the lab, we do a whole series of cognitive testings and we look at what's going on in your brain when you play this video game. And then you go home, you play the game at home. We have a collaboration with Apple who donated these laptops for this experiment. And so you play the game at home and while you're playing, the computer's recording how your performance changes and it downloads in real time right to our laboratory. And then you come back afterwards and again we look at what's happening in your brain and look to see if you improved on this task and other memory tasks. One thing that we're working on now is a collaboration with another company, NeuroFocus, to use headsets that are being developed so we can record brain activity of our participants while they're in their own homes and send that information right to our lab to really basically move our laboratory into people's homes to understand what's changing in your brain as you get better at doing these things. I'm going to show you some preliminary data. So this is just five people before and after, unpublished, but it gave us some confidence that we might be on the right track here. So what you're going to see here is performance across 12 hours of home play on this game that we developed. These are the younger adults, these are the older adults. And so we see improvement in both groups. Granted, the angle, you know, the slope is not the same. So our younger adults do seem to be learning more rapidly on this, but our older adults do learn. If you looked at the individual data, even one of our older adults is sort of in this angle at learning at the same rate as our younger participants. So this is encouraging that you learn on this task well over this period of time. Another thing we did was ask about the cost. So we think of distraction and multitasking as, as, as resulting in a cost in your performance. So this red line is how well you perform if there was no distraction present, if there was no multitasking. And you could see these dots along the line. So this is how the shooting in the game performances, and this is the driving part of the game. And you can see the younger adults are here in yellow, and the older adults are here in blue. And you can see there's a cost on the pre-training before they did the training at home. And you can see that's over here too. But if we take a look at what happens after training, we see that and we see that, which is really quite remarkable because every single individual, although there's only 10 people in this pilot study, everyone resolved the cost. Some people all the way to zero. I mean, if you follow some of these lines, you could see they were quite impaired by multitasking and it was really gone after just 12 hours. So now we're looking to see how does this ability to get better at doing this task lead to better memory, better attention, better multitasking skills in general. So this gives you, this is meant to just give you a flavor of how we're approaching this issue in our lab. We think that it's really exciting data in general and, and from, from many groups in that it shows that the older brain is capable of plasticity, which a lot of you are aware of now because it's really reached the public eye. But there was a long period of time where we thought that this ability to improve with challenge was something that was mostly there for children, not even young adults. And now we realize that's not true, that this ability, this plasticity, the ability of your brain to reshape itself uh, given a st the appropriate stimulus exists throughout your life. And so we're hoping to use this ability of our brain to grow and to re, sort of repair itself when challenged in the right way to improve cognitive abilities and hopefully improve the abilities of people that have dementia and increase the or decrease the, the time period um, by which it appears. So if, you, if it would have become a functional impairment in your life at 60 and because you've challenged your brain in the most appropriate way, it doesn't happen until you're 65, that's a really big service. So we're still at the beginning of this. We don't have all the answers, but at least this gives you a little picture of where we're hoping this field can go if we combine the approaches that we use in a university to study this with, with you know, very fine care and the type of advances that are made in industry where they actually develop these products. So it gives you an idea of how I hope and others hope that universities can work with industry to really tell you what actually works to improve your cognitive abilities. Thank you.
right, good evening everyone. My name is Brian Betcher and I'm a neuropsychology fellow here at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. Um, it's really a privilege to be able to speak with an engaged, really well-informed crowd about a topic that I think is important to all of us, which is preventing cognitive decline. Um, you know, although this is a topic that I think is salient and really widely talked about, there's a lot of questions remaining, not the least of which is, will exercise and Sudoku save the day? <laughs> I can't promise I'm going to answer all of those questions, but I thought I might put that out there in the beginning. So on a regular basis, we seem to be bombarded with media images and dialogues about how to age successfully, whether it's via the new computer brain exercise technique or a miraculous new anti-wrinkle cream. Uh, so kind of weeding through these messages we receive can be cumbersome. And I think parsing out fact from fiction when it comes to healthy aging is, is not always an easy task. So one of the newest buzz phrases is this uh, term successful aging. I, have mixed feelings about this phrase because I don't like that at the other end of it is unsuccessful aging. But I do think what these phrases really try to hint at is that for the most part, uh, we don't want to just live longer lives. We want to live longer lives that are socially, emotionally, and intellectually fulfilling. And part and parcel of that discussion is staving off dementia, which is something I will be talking about tonight. Okay, so transitioning from Dr. Ghazali's talk um, on cognitive training, I'm going to talk just kind of briefly about cognitive engagement and cognitive exercise, followed by a more in-depth discussion of physical exercise and how that might impact our thinking, and hopefully also talk a little bit about future directions of the work as well. I should also say that when I was organizing this talk, I really tried to hone in on questions that might sort of be percolating in the crowd right now. So for the first part, I really try to focus on can we build a reserve that buffers against dementia? And also, has marketing surpassed science? Maybe you already know the answer to that. Well, <laughs> kind of already hinting at it. But um, in thinking about how we re really build this reserve that Dr. Ghazali hinted at, that buffers against dementia, one of the most striking examples comes from the early NUN studies. So the NUN study refers to this longitudinal study of Catholic sisters, specifically members of the School Sisters of Notre Dame congregation. And approximately 678 Catholic centers were enrolled, and uh, their ages ranged from about 75 to 102 when the study began in 1991. And what was really amazing about the study is that the sisters received annual examinations, and they all agreed to donate their brains for autopsy upon death. Um, and furthermore, all the sisters had written a detailed autobiography of their lives upon entrance into the convent. Um, that way we could really go back and get a sense of any, any predictors that might be able to associate with how they were doing later. So although we could definitely argue that the lives of nuns may not mirror our own, um, maybe I should speak for myself, but um, I think what's really uh, striking about this is that these individuals were women who had very similar environments. And so even if there are differences, we could really kind of parse out some of those things that are difficult in research today. So researchers led by Dr. David Snowden at the University of Kentucky reported several important findings, including the observation that some nuns had brains that were riddled with Alzheimer's disease pathology, and yet they did not show any signs of a dementia or cognitive impairment. And Dr. Snowden in particular reported several case examples, and including one of the sister that is shown here. And he really did this to kind of illustrate differences that he noted in pathology and clinical presentation. So for example, the sister that's presented here reportedly died at 104 years of age, and she was relatively healthy, and importantly, didn't show any signs of dementia. So upon autopsy, however, they noted that the severity of Alzheimer's disease pathology in her brain was at a stage four, which really suggests moderate spread of the disease in her brain, including the areas of the, br the brain that are responsible for memories, which are the hippocampus. So in addition to that, 
um, in some of the follow-up analyses, and these, this study has been going on for quite some time, they examined early life differences between the nuns that might explain why some showed pathology without any kind of concomitant cognitive problem. And of particular interest to them was early life language ability, which is used as sort of as proxy for general knowledge and uh, linguistic ability. So they examined the extent to which idea density, um, a measure, again, of sort of linguistics, so they kind of looked at verb use, complex propositions, adjectives. They looked at how the idea density in these autobiographies that they wrote were related to late life expression of cognitive functioning in participants. And these idea density measures, again, were really gleaned from these autobiographies that they wrote when they were in their 20s. And so what they found was that there was this strong relationship between early life language abilities and late life cognitive functioning. And this is illustrated in the figure here. So if you look here, sort of irrespective of whether or not they had pathology in their brain, the intact cognitive group, so the group that didn't show any problems in everyday life, were the ones that had the highest idea density scores in their autobiographies, indicating that their uh, language abilities in early life were really sort of predicting how they were doing much later. I think this is really fascinating work and something that has been followed up with quite a bit. So stemming from this research is the question of how can there be such heterogeneity in clinical outcome among individuals who have similar degrees of pathology. And what we see under a microscope really does not always reflect what we see in everyday life. It's not necessarily this one-to-one -one connection that I think a lot of us think there is. Mm -hmm. So thus, when you examine individuals with the same severity of Alzheimer's disease in the brain, some may show Alzheimer's disease dementia, so they're showing problems with everyday functioning, and other individuals will be clinically normal. So why is this, and how can we tip the scales towards a clinically normal, no-dementia presentation? And one theory that's been evaluated and has led to this kind of influx of research on cognitive exercise is the theory of cognitive reserve, which is what Dr. Ghazali was hinting at earlier. So cognitive reserve was propagated by Yakov Stern, he's at Columbia University, and to account for the disparity between the degree of pathology someone has in their brain and their clinical presentation. So what is cognitive reserve? It's sort of a tricky concept. Um, it really relies on the idea that there are individual differences in how tasks are processed that permit some people to cope better than others with brain changes. I think that sounds really vague, so let's get a little more detailed into it. So in the face of aging or even Alzheimer's disease pathology, a brain with higher cognitive reserve may try to cope with impending changes by using pre-existing cognitive strategies more efficiently or it might try to use different strategies to affect the same goal. Um, so kind of reserve is really hard to measure. It's a sort of this theoretical construct. And what we often do as researchers is we use proxies for that. So we use things like educational attainment. So how far did you go to school? How far did you go in school? Um, occupation, so do you have a very intellectually engaging work life? Um, and mental activity. So do you read? Do you go out to movies? Are you having an intellectually engaging life outside as well? So those are the things that we try to tap into when we're looking at this construct. And because of that, we're also trying to look at how do we boost cognitive reserve in people. So consistent with what we saw in the NUN studies, this also suggests that individuals with cognitive reserve may be able to tolerate or handle greater amounts of damage to the brain before they start to show similar levels of impairment. So the figure here illustrates this model nicely, I think. And it shows that at the same level of brain pathology, that individuals with higher cognitive reserve are still able to do the task better. And another way to look at this figure is that individuals with higher cognitive reserve, that in order for them to kind of get down to this lower level of performance, they need more pathology in their brain. So they're able to tolerate that more. Sort of what Dr. Gozali was saying earlier, that it's not necessarily that, it, that the pathology is not there, it's just we're not manifesting it the same way if you have cognitive reserve, high cognitive reserve. 
And I think, you know, there's been, there's been some debate about this, but I think there's also been some tremendous support about the benefits of high cognitive reserve. More recently, uh, a group in New York, uh, the researcher's name is Adam Brickman, he can try to confirm this model by looking at the white matter of older adults' brains on imaging. And the white matter is really these fiber bundles that connect different parts of your brain. And he showed that to have the same level of impairment, someone with higher cognitive reserve needed more changes to their white matter, suggesting that they were able to cope with pathology better than those with lower reserve. And I think, you know, ultimately what's nice about this model is that it's an active model. So it doesn't assume that you need a certain amount of change to your brain before you start showing difficulties in everyday life. Instead, it really focuses on the processes that allow individuals to experience these changes and still maintain a similar level of functioning. And I think what's also hopeful about the recent data is that even late stage interventions to improve cognitive reserve look promising, which could ultimately delay dementia or cognitive decline in some individuals. Okay, I think a natural extension of this topic is that of cognitive exercise, which I think a lot of people are interested in. And I'll briefly touch on this topic. Um, so translating this cognitive reserve literature into interventions has been a really difficult process. Um, there's this extensive scientific literature that is messy and pretty difficult to interpret. So brain games, Sudoku, uh, intellectual engagement, these have kind of been heavily fed into the media as some sort of ultimate panacea for cognitive decline. And I should say that a lot of this has occurred without substantial support for it. So I'm going to put that out there initially. Um, what, so what do we know about these things? Some encouraging results were recently reported in the Archives of Neurology showing that people with high rates of intellectual leisure activity, so again, like reading magazines, books, um, going to classes, playing cards, uh, they were protected in that their cognitive decline started later in life than those who did not engage in those activities. So sort of like preliminary evidence supporting that. And there have been other studies that have corroborated these findings suggesting that an intellectually rich life may buffer against or stave off dementia. However, I also want to make a cautionary note that while this is promising, we really need more controlled trials where we attempt to get at the cause and effect of this before we can fully believe everything. Um, similarly, there's been a lot of buzz about cognitive interventions. So broadly speaking, much of the research on interventions focuses on rehabilitation and training. Um, and these findings have been mixed, so some studies have shown a pretty tremendous amount of uh, support that interventions might improve your cognitive functioning, while others have shown a little bit of lackluster results. Um, I think in a recent review by, his name is Dr. Valenzuela from the University of New South Wales, there was this evaluation of all recent studies, and it suggested that cognitive interventions may indeed be helpful and have therapeutic benefits. Um, per particularly when there's training in multiple cognitive domains instead of these kind of basic memory strategy games that have been sort of presented out there. Um, importantly, I think the National Institute on Health has funded numerous studies that are going to be examining this issue. And I think there's still more research that's needed, but overall these, this, this research is happening right now, so that's also the good news. But as I said, more research is needed on that. So wrapping up the cognitive engagement section of my presentation, I want to get back to the initial questions that I sort of posed at the outset of the talk. So can we build a reserve that buffers against cognitive decline and dementia? I think there's preliminary evidence to suggest that we can build a cognitive reserve that helps delay cognitive impairments, um, but precisely what that might entail is still a little bit unclear. And most of the promising studies are observational studies. So Again, we need more intervention type studies. And because of that, I would say that yes, marketing has surpassed science in this regard. Um, and the reason I say this is that I really want everyone to be educated consumers of the information that's being presented to you. At the uh, Memory and Aging Center, something that we pretty frequently tell patients and their healthy family members um, is that if if you're doing a game and it's something that you find stressful or overwhelming, then it's probably not going to be as helpful. We really encourage people to engage in activities that they find personally meaningful to them and something that they would enjoy doing. 
Okay, so now I want to move on to something that I'm actually pretty excited about and optimistic about. And this is the research underscoring the benefits of exercise on cognitive functioning. And so in thinking about this, the questions that I was trying to answer was, were if I didn't exercise when I was younger, is it too late? And how could exercise possibly affect the clarity of my thinking? I think it seems a little bit distant compared to the cognitive training, but the mechanisms for that are, are ones that we're starting to really understand. Okay, so studies that follow older adults over several years have shown that physical activity is associated with up to like a 30% to 50% reduction in the risk of cognitive decline. So there's actually very robust studies that are coming out right now, particularly aerobic activity like brisk walking. And speaking of walking, uh, one of the first studies that prospectively followed older adults to sort of tease apart how physical activity might impact cognition was a study conducted by Christine Yaffe at UCSF. She reported that amongst a group of 5,925 community dwelling older adult women, that those that walked more blocks in their neighborhood were less likely to develop cognitive decline over a period of six to eight years. Um, and this is shown in the figure here. And in this case, uh, a higher bar means more decline. So a higher bar is worse in this case. But you can see here that the more blocks that women walk, the less decline that they were having. So it's one of those preliminary early studies that really started to give credence to the idea that physical exercise might actually impact cognition. More recently, Christine Yaffe and some of her colleagues have also tried to answer the question, does it really matter when I start exercising? So if I didn't exercise when I was younger, is that a problem now? And I think, again, this is also very optimistic and promising research. So women who reported being physically active, particularly during their teenage years, uh, showed a lower likelihood of cognitive impairment in later life. But women who were inactive during their teenage years but became active in their 30s, 50s, and so on, still did better than those who were never active. So although we do see you know, quite a benefit from exercising from an early age, this study really sort of points to the fact that you can reap the benefits of exercise across the lifespan. So the last two studies were more what we call epidemiological examinations of cognitive decline. So let's kind of turn our attention to what's actually happening in the brain. Um, and for the first part, I just want to show you an animal study, because this, uh, this, this one in particular wasn't one of the earlier studies, but this is one of the most robust findings, in that research with animals has shown that a molecule in the brain called brain-derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF, uh, is critical for neuron health and important for the plasticity of our synapses. And exercise has been shown to have a robust effect on BDNF levels in the brain. And in this case, if you have rats run on a wheel for as little as a week, they have nearly a 1.5-fold increase in BDNF expression in four areas of their hippocampus. This is the area of the brain, again, that's important for forming new memories. So at the top here, you see a slice of that from rats that were involved in this exercise compared to ones that did not exercise here. And this is uh, an effect that they actually could see even three months later. Although considerable more research needs to be done with humans, and particularly older adults, um, to fully elucidate how exercise might impact cognition, um, the recent work is promising, again. And for example, in a 2010 study by Ho and colleagues, they applied this technique called tensor-based morphometry on high-resolution MRI. And they were trying to determine if physical activity was associated with the actual volumes in the brain. And so they found that with each incremental increase in physical activity that was reported, that it was associated with a 2 to 2.5% two greater average tissue volume. And these effects were detected in areas of the brain important for processing speed, working memory, um, so this is one of the more recent studies showing something that's actually happening in the brain as a result of people exercising. And this is also something that we call a dose effect. So the more people exercise, the larger these volumes were. So again, I think that's actually pretty exciting work. 
And I think almost more importantly, we're starting to get at why this might happen. Um, so what are the mechanisms by which physical activity may actually confer benefit? This is really helpful for us to know in terms of designing interventions, in terms of knowing how much, how little. And as you might guess, physical activity is related to lower rates of obesity. And obesity, particularly when you're in your middle age, has been shown to significantly associate with dementia in later life. And physical activity is also related to a variety of uh, vascular risk factors. So when you think about cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, all of these have been shown to be related to worse cognitive functioning. And sort of akin to that as well is markers are markers of inflammation. So inflammation is sort of this hot topic right now in terms of cognitive functioning. And for those of you who attended some of the previous lectures, you've probably heard a little bit about this from our lab. So higher levels of inflammatory markers have been shown to be related to uh, lower cognitive functioning in healthy older people. So in this case, we looked at an inflammatory marker called C-reactive protein, and in healthy older adults, those with even just detectable levels of C-reactive protein performed worse on an episodic memory test that we gave them, so asking them to recall words over a short period of time. So this is another way in which uh, physical exercise is affecting cognition, albeit sort of an indirect way. And finally, there's been a wide array of research that's shown, uh, that's really been examining how physical exercise may positively impact neuronal functioning. So consistent with the slide that I was showing you earlier on BDNF, um, one of the most consistent findings in the animal literature is this positive relationship between exercise and brain functioning. And in humans, similar evidence has been shown to be true. And they've really thought that the mechanism by which this is occurring is that you have this sort of stimulation of a release of neurotrophins and they promote neuronal growth and uh, survival. So that's sort of the mechanism that people are working with in terms of the neuronal function as well. Again, for all of these, it's important to keep in mind that controlled intervention trials are really needed to see how these will work. But I think compared to how I was presenting cognitive functioning, we're really getting an idea of how this might be affecting our thinking. <coughs> Although not included in the previous model, and I think often not talked about a lot, um, something else to keep in mind is that physical exercise also affects your mood, and mood has been shown to be connected with the clarity of your thinking as well. So physical exercise has been shown to reduce stress and to also improve mood. Um, so people who are depressed, who are exercising, all these have been shown to improve mood over time. And although, again, there's more studies that are coming on this, uh, this is another sort of indirect way that this might be affecting the clarity of your thinking um, and probably something that doesn't get enough press right now. Okay, so to sort of sum up everything, the physical exercise part of it, um, in terms of the question, if I didn't exercise when I was younger, is it too late? I think that the evidence right now, although preliminary, suggests that the answer is no, that there's considerable evidence that you can reap the benefits of exercise across the lifespan. And then in terms of how could exercise possibly affect the clarity of my thinking, um, I think from what we were talking about earlier that there's this whole span of psychological and biological mechanisms that this is working by, um, particularly in terms of affecting your risk factors like obesity, vascular risk factors, improving your neural functioning, improving your mood, all of these sort of interact to help create a better situation for your thinking as well. Okay, and I know I've been talking a while, let me just quickly say for future directions, um, to sort of hammer that home, I really think we need more randomized control intervention trials. And so we need trials where we are actually having people do a set regimen, looking at what kind of interventions work. We need longitudinal studies, so following people over a long period of time to see how these might affect you 10 years from now. We also really need to clarify how much cognitive and physical exercise is required before we see the benefit. How long do we need to do each? Will they improve cognition or will they mainly make it where you don't decline? These are all sort of different questions that we need to still work out. Okay, thank you.
lots of exercise and video games for 12 hours. I'm going to talk about taking a pill, maybe several pills. I'm Ron Finley. I'm the pharmacist in the Memory and Aging Center and have been for a number of years. For the next 25 or so minutes, I'd like to review with you some of the issues about memory, medications, and money. I grew up in the foothills of the Ozarks in southern Missouri, and there's a saying there that if two people speak long enough, sooner or later, they're talking about money. So one of the things I hope you'll come away with is a way to save some money. But more importantly than that is a better perspective of what is a drug. And as I tell all my clients and my patients in the memory clinic, I want you to think of anything you take, be it a prescription drug, an over-the-counter drug, or an herbal or nutraceutical or dietary supplement as a drug. And that's very important. So if you don't take anything away from this tonight, from my part, I want you to remember that. And when you see your physicians, take a list of everything that you take, all of those drugs, so that he or she knows what you're taking. My disclosures, I speak for several pharmaceutical companies. Uh, none of them have partic participated in the preparation of this program. I'm associate editor of a national newsletter for drug therapy and I consult for several private health care groups, in addition to being the pharmacist in the memory clinic. So for the last few weeks, you've learned a lot about the brain and how complex it is. I think of the brain in my way of thinking of it as a pharmacist. I think of it really as a solar system, as a galaxy, and there's a lot going on out there at a lot of different levels. There's a lot of tracks in the brain that you've learned about, and neurotransmitters, chemicals that help in the transmission of impulses through the brain. So when you pop that little pill, that little green tablet that you got on the internet that arrived in that little brown box without anything to say what this is for, that's to do something up there. So let's take a look at some of these products and we're going to start with the prescription products. I know you've already talked about those, but I'm going to focus on probably one of the reasons that Many individuals, not only in this country, I've lived in Africa, I've practiced in Ethiopia, I've taught in Japan several times and traveled in other areas of the world. And not only do Americans take a lot of medications, but it's true in other places of the world too. So the drugs, as you know, we have to treat Alzheimer's disease are the cholinesterase inhibitors, and their role is to prevent the breakdown of a very important chemical called acetylcholine or acetylcholine in the brain that's important for memory transmission and other functions too. So there are three of those. There's another drug called Mimentine or Nemenda. It's an NMDA inhibitor, big long name, but it's involved in another neurotransmitter called glutamine. And these products, quite honestly, and I'm sure you've heard this before, are not what we would like. These are not great drugs. Some people benefit more than others. In certain types of dementias, like Lewy body dementia, those individuals initially may have a better, more positive response than, say, someone with Alzheimer's. But they're not what we like, and they're not cures, unfortunately. So that's the goal, right, is to reverse this disease, Alzheimer's or the other dementias, or prevent them. So usually in my experience, when that's the situation, a lot of other things come up, a lot of advertising. I was looking under NMDA, and I came up with this. It's a muscle warfare product. And it's got a number of things it says it does, but one thing is it provides enormous strength, speed, endurance, and increases my results. Use with caution. It has something to do with sexual performance, I think. <laughs> so advertising in this area sometimes is a bit overboard. I think we could say that. But it's also true when you watch television or you read something in a magazine and the ads about various non-prescription drugs. And honestly, having worked for a pharmaceutical company, and I have a lot of respect for them, but I think sometimes we over-advertise the benefits of prescription drugs too. So there's a little guilt to go around here. But let's look and think about medications that come from plants from natural sources. And I think we forget we have some very important drugs. Some of these you're familiar with, digoxin for the heart, 
It's been around for several hundred years. Taxol from the yew tree for cancer, Sincona. By the way, in about, it was the 18th century in England, malaria was treated by purging and bleeding. That was a, that was a standard treatment. That was what you did. And there was a guy named Robert Talbor, I believe was his last name, was an herbalist and a part of a group called Quacks. There actually was a group called Quacks. And he was treating these people, my God, with something called Sincona Jesuit's bark. And he was right. So there's a history of, sometimes there's a real grain of truth here, and we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So caffeine, you're all familiar with that. I had some this evening. That's probably why I'm getting my energy from. Maybe it's that exercise, Brie, I don't know, but I, maybe that. It's probably the most common form of our antioxidants in our diet is caffeine, coffee. Opium, obviously useful as a pain medication, belladonna. Your tomato plant is a Solanaceae family. For many centuries, it was thought to be poisonous. No one ate those tomatoes. Someone, bright soul, I heard it was in Italy. I don't know if it's true. Made a paste from it and said it's also improved sexual performance. It became very popular. And they learned they could eat the tomato. Periwinkle, then Christine for cancer. Uh, cannabis, sativa. What is that? Anyone in this room know what that is? Cannabis? <laughs> of course. And it's a, marijuana has been used for centuries also as a medicinal. And we have some prescription products that are extracts from that. How about Rewiffia serpentina? Anyone know what that is? It was one of the original, actually effective blood pressure medicines in the 60s and 70s. Reserpine comes from snake root from India. How about this one, Caucasian snowdrop? Now that, you should know that. If you can share it with me, has anyone here ever had a gout attack? Anyone? Some? Okay, a couple people nodding. If you took something called cochicine, that's one of the products that comes from this. There's a whole family of these. The other drug that comes from this family of plants is called galantamine, raisidine. It also comes from the daffodil family. So it has its origins back in folk mess and going back to the time of Homer, back in ancient Greece. So a lot of products very useful products, some of them very potent. Digoxin is a very potent drug. Get too much of it, we can stop your heart, cause arrhythmias, very difficult to control. But I hear this all the time. You know, Ron, natural products are safer than prescription products. They have fewer side effects. Is that true? No? no? You don't believe that? Well, you're right. Actually, there are a number of natural products. <laughs> that are very poisonous. In fact, we have some very good drugs that come from snake venom. If you take something called an ACE inhibitor, your lisinopril and allopril, very effective drugs for heart failure, high blood pressure, those originally came from the venom of a South American viper. Okay, it was an extract of that. You can tell this is a viper because it has elliptical pupils. If you can see those, you're way too close. <laughs> this is a copperhead. East of the Rockies, that's a rattlesnake for those over there interested in such things. Okay, now I'm going to go through what I call the 188-second dietary supplement review. So I'm going to touch on a whole lot of different herbal products. Ginkgo biloba. There is no good evidence that ginkgo biloba pre prevents or treats Alzheimer's, unfortunately. What I do see is that it's an antiplatelet drug. It's similar in some respects to aspirin, and some patients get excessive bruising if they're also taking aspirin from it there are reports of spontaneous hemorrhages, several in the eye, which kind of stands to reason because you can see that uh, even with drugs like aspirin that are antiplatelet drugs. In fact, about 15% of strokes are that type of stroke or bleeding. So I don't tell people and don't say don't take it, but it's important to let your doctor know that you're on that. It may or may not interact with drugs like Coumadin and Warfarin. Huperzine is Chinese club moss. You probably have never heard of that, but it's going to come up again. Chinese club moss is very similar to its effect on the body as your drugs like Aricept, Exelon, and Razodine. It's a real drug. And it may have some benefits in clinical trials right now. Most of the papers are out of China. And we'll see how that works out. But what's important is to read that label if you take products that have multiple herbals in them. If one of them is this product, Uprazine A, your doctor needs to know because if he or she starts you or your loved one 
on a drug like Aricept, and now you're having some really, really bad nausea and vomiting, is because you've got two drugs that have the same side effects. So it's an herbal, comes from Chinese club moss. It is a real drug. Lecithin does not improve memory. Senior moment, there's no such thing as a senior moment. There's a freshman moment, but no such thing as a senior moment. Walking behind two psychiatrists, this actually happened at a geriatric psychiatry meeting a couple of years ago. One turned to the other, and they were older adults. And they said, you know, I don't mind being a senior, but graduation kind of bothers me. <laughs> Vitamin E does not prevent Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we thought at one time very large doses based on a study by Sano et al. It might slow the progression of the disease and reduce the and time to nursing home placement or death. That turned out not to be true. There is some concern about large amounts of vitamin E as being, there was a study uh, out of, um, I think it was Johns Hopkins, a uh, uh, meta-analysis of several studies that they included to come up with the conclusion that 400 units of vitamin E increases the risk for death. But if that had been true in California, we would have seen a really, you know, a lot of people go by the wayside a long time ago. So that turned out not to be true. So vitamin E, though, in doses probably above 800 units might, might be a problem as interacting with some anticoagulants. So if you're on warfarin, they'll usually want you to have you taking less than that. So B12 does not give you energy, but may be useful if you have low B12 levels or if you have something involved. Uh, a, some, a biochemical in the blood called homocysteine. So if, if that is excessively high, you may need certain vitamins to help bring that down. Phosphatidylserine actually came, originally the studies were done, it came from the, cor the cortex, the brain, part of the brain of a cow. So since I've been involved in a prion disease study here, uh, I don't think anyone that I know of would take anything that comes from a cow derivative. And now actually they generally are manufactured from soy protein but no real advantage. These are products supposed to increase cerebral perfusion. In Asia, particularly in Japan, a lot of the products that I saw there, that was the intent, but there's no indication that it actually improves memory or treats or retards any type of dementia. And this is a member of the Vinca family. Again, that's from a, a plant, as I mentioned, the same one, same family that the uh, cancer drug uh, is from. This is diethyl amino ethanol, times up every now and then. I throw this in because it's going to come up in a few minutes. This is an old prescription drug. It is not an herbal product or a natural product. Now, I don't know how companies are getting by with this, probably because the FDA has little or no say in a lot of these products and doesn't review them. But I'm seeing more and more products, and I do have some concern about it. This is a product used in the plastic and the, in the resin uh, industry. Uh, so it's used in industry and it's actually the idea is supposed to be a precursor to a neurotransmitter, but that's really questionable. There was a study in 1981 in the Journal of American Medical Association and it showed no, absolutely no benefit for Alzheimer's or for memory. About half the people in the drug part of the study dropped out because of adverse side effects. And garlic, we all know, has many, many possible and has probably some therapeutic uh, indications. It's not, in my experience, a very good blood pressure medicine. It does have some, in high doses, antiplatelet effect, and actually has some antibacterial and antifungal effect, but those are purified forms. That's not just eating the raw form of it. But there's an old saying in New York that, you know, a dollar will get you on the bus, but a couple sticks of garlic will get you a seat, because people <laughs> don't want to sit next to you. Um, Bacopa comes from a tropical plant family, widely used in India, it's supposed for general well-being. General well-being. I don't know about that. We'll see. Phosphatidylcholine, again, is a precursor to acetylcholine. Lipoic acid is a coenzyme. These are theoretically, what they play on a lot of this advertising is animal studies and theoretical benefits. These are not, almost never controlled scientific studies. Uh, coenzyme Q10, a lot of interest in coenzyme Q10 right now. Uh, very large doses we thought might slow the progression of uh, Parkinson's disease in an early study, but subsequent studies unfortunately uh, did not uh, support that. So we'll see. There's studies going on in other conditions now. By large, I'm talking about 1,200, 1,500 milligrams a day. That's very expensive, so and I don't recommend that uh, for those. St. John's Wards, another one to watch out for. It interacts with a lot of drugs, a couple of people, a few, 
about 20 years ago, lost their kidneys because St. John's wort interfered with the immunosuppressive drugs that were being used so that their bodies would support the foreign kidney that had been put in their body. So St. John's wort is probably a pretty effective antidepressant for mild and moderate depression, but it interacts with a lot of different drugs that go through the liver, some of the coenzyme 3A4. So there are a lot of drugs that go through that pathway through the liver, and this, this actual uh, product actually interferes with those. So that's very, very important. Again, that's also in a lot of combination products. Valerian, you all know, if you've ever smelled real valerian, you can tell it. It smells like old shoes uh, that have been around for some time or socks that haven't been washed in a few centuries. Uh, a lot of my patients take it, a mild sedative, and I think that's fine. Uh, coconut oil, anyone knows what coconut oil is being used for? No? Okay. Coconut oil, don't run out and do this now. Coconut oil is supposed to establish something called a type of ketones that the brain can use as energy and increase your brain energy. So Andrew, Andrew Weil, Weil or Wheel? Is it Weil? Wild, thank you. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't recommend it, and I don't either. Kava Kava uh, is a stimulant, can be a hallucinogenic, can be habit-forming. It's used in the South Sea Islands. And actually, liver toxicity has been reported with commercial products. So I think you're, get it, you're getting the idea here, right? Reservatrol, Veritrol, right, is not Merlot. Uh, Spanish red wine probably has the highest content, at least that I've seen. It's about 13 milligrams per liter. A dose of it is about 325 milligrams, so about 6.6 .6 gallons of red wine. Uh, if you can handle that in a day, come and see me. <laughs> okay, antioxidants. Now, here's my point. All I want you to take away from this. A lot of the commercial products are advertising antioxidants. This is an antioxidant. It protects your brain cells. It does this. The best antioxidants are in nature. They're right there. Your blueberries, your strawberries, your raspberries, prunes. Coffee is actually a pretty good antioxidant. That's my, my advice is get them there. It's a lot more fun. And not only that, but you actually get the actual real product. A lot of the studies that I see or the advertising is based on nutritional studies showing that people that ate certain things benefited from it. I've seen that in a number of cancer studies. So the active ingredients may not be that one specific thing because these plant products contain hundreds or thousands of actually sometimes active ingredients. I skipped the Brussels sprout, so. <laughs> okay, now you're on the internet. Now we're looking for something that want to stay sharp, want to stay alert, feed your mind and protect against memory. Don't have to jog miles and miles. Don't have to do computer programs. Oh, that's pretty... That'd be pretty nice, actually, Adam. I wouldn't mind doing that if I could have a red Ferrari neural racer. <laughs> so this is the way to go, right? So we just pop a couple pills. Well, let's see what's in this. It's only a probably about $20, $20 or something like that. So we've got our ginkgo biloba, right? We talked about that. We got our acetylcarnitine, St. John's wort. Well, that's a red flag. That's a problem, right? If we're on prescription drugs like Xanax or a number of others. And here's a DMA, DMAE. This used to be called DNR as a prescription. Um, not a good idea. I don't like putting chemicals that are used in the plastic industry in my body. Something about that just puts me off. The bacopin is okay. Uh, Vimpocetin has no real advantage. And the phosphatidylserine, I really do want to know where that comes from. So I want to be sure that comes from a plant source. So this is not a product, obviously, that I would recommend. But it's prudent to read the labels. One of my favorite authors, Mark Twain, said, if you base your health care on what you read, you better be careful because you might die of a misprint. <laughs> Vitamins do not give you energy. If you, ever have, if you have children, as I had some years ago, you realize that that's true. All the vitamins you take, you're not getting that sleep, you're still not going to have energy. However, they are important for good, basic, healthy function of the body and the brain. And it's possible in certain conditions that your doctor may recommend that you need to take some additional of a particular vitamin, additional amount. I'm seeing actually more vitamin D now used in higher doses for maybe uh, protection against prophylaxis of cardiovascular disease of certain types. So there's a lot of interest in that. But we, we tend to be very sort of faddish, if you will. We go through these cycles. 
when you select a vitamin product, look for a product that has only what you really need in it. And my point here, these have lots of other things in them. And this one, the Super Memory Support, actually has, if you look very carefully in there, something called Chinese Club Moss. That's the one that I mentioned earlier that is a real drug. A lot of these are real drugs. So that would be one to be careful of. It has a lot of other things that you don't need and you don't want to pay for them. The more drugs you take, the greater the chance for a drug interaction, drug herbal, drug plant interaction, if you will, the greater the chance for a side effect. It's just very clear. Nutraceuticals. I'm going to zip through these fairly quickly, but it's important, and this is sort of a new category now. This is a drug that failed an Alzheimer's test. It's related to an amino acid called taurine. And it, as far as I know, of no benefit. The company took it, they, someone made another company, and now they're marketing it on television, or at least on the uh, TV, I mean, sorry, on the internet. So these are the things to watch out for. I think the, these are the pitfalls. So good nutrition is certainly very important. Uh, the amount of fish in your diet, omega-3s or a fish oil has some benefits. Discuss it with your doctor on how much to take. It is possible to take too much of the fish oil itself. Probably not possible to eat too much fish because the prices in our area are a lot higher than this. <laughs> right? This is from Seattle. Another area that's emerged in recent years is something called medical foods. So these are not approved as drugs by the Federal Drug Administration. They require a prescription and they're to treat specific conditions. This product is to treat cognitive change, cognitive impairment, or Alzheimer's disease, if you will. And again, it's planned to do what the coconut oil does, uh, the medium chain triglycerides is, is designed to increase ketones in the brain to improve the nutrition of the brain. I've looked at the studies that this company has and quite honestly I'm not impressed at all and my personal opinion is I don't think it's worthwhile. So what else is coming? Well there are lots of things and these are in the areas of dietary supplements. There's, there's thousands of them out there. I can only touch on a few. But I can give you a few tips about them. So dietary supplements are not reviewed or approved by the Federal Drug Administration, no matter what they may say in their advertising. The manufacturers are responsible for safety, and safety becomes an issue when there's a problem. Let me give you an example. There was a product out for prostate cancer. Uh, it contained, I think, six Chinese herbs and soft palmetto. Unfortunately, two of the Chinese herbs are estrogens. They cause estrogens in animals and humans. So you can have hormones in plants. And this two, these two products had female hormones. And in males, they cause sometimes in large breasts an increased frequency of blood clots. So some bright soul decided to put a prescription drug called Coumadin, warfarin, warfarin an anticoagulant in there. And we began to see cases of bleeding. That's how it got reported. So there may be real drugs in there besides the ones that are on the label. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So the manufacturer is responsible for the safety. Manufacturers are supposed to make accurate claims for their products, and I see an amazing amount of misinformation out there. Now, that's also true in other areas. It's not just in this area. If I look at the claims for some new cars, uh, I think I could say the same thing. However, to me, this is a little more important. Purity is unknown. I'm going to come back to that. Purity is unknown. So you're paying for 120 milligrams in that capsule. There's no guarantee there's that much in there. Absolutely. And sometimes there's not. There's no guarantee there's not heavy metals in there, arsenic, lead, or mercury. There's no guarantee there's not pesticides in there, only if a problem shows up. So having said that, there are some companies that submit their products for testing by the United States Pharmacopeia and another group, private group called Consumer Lab. Uh, and in fact, that is some assurance, I think, that the product has been tested. And being an informed consumer is a product manufacturer in the United States, and I tell all of my, my patients I, to avoid it if it's made in Asia, flat out, flat out, if it's made in Asia. There was a product, uh, there was actually one study out of India that 23% of the products contained excessive amounts of heavy metals. So 
Uh, there, I could go on and on, but, but that is my, sorry, my, my caveat, my warning. Is the manufacturer's product approved by the USP or a consumer lab? Does the label list the number of the herbs and the amounts, the milligrams, and is there a number to call as the expiration date on it? And I have to say to their credit, I've called two companies recently and they sent me their testing and they tested for heavy metals and pesticides and potency and that's very, very important. Okay, slowing the aging process. You've learned a lot of things, I think. This is one approach and I, and I encourage people that are interested in herbal medicine to use the traditional approach. Traditional Chinese medicine is not just herbs and it's usually a combination devised by a practitioner in traditional medicine for you as an individual. It's also meditation, it's exercise, and it's diet. It's a combination. It's, it becomes a lifestyle. It's not something, and this is my opinion, that you can pop a pill and that you can accomplish that. So management of your diabetes, hypertension, elevated cholesterols, learning new skills, use it or lose it. I'm a big believer in that. Cardiovascular exercise, what's good for the heart, as we're learning more and more, is good for the brain. So keep that in mind. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. Have a reasonable and safe nutritional program. Avoid smoking and excessive alcohol. I'm not sure what excessive is. I know there are various terms for that. Uh, social support networks, obviously important. And sharing with others, being involved, involved being committed. So those are the things I want to leave you with. I've given you some resources. Uh, some are not expensive. Uh, the Consumer Lab is, I think, around $20 a year. Uh, much more detailed is the natural database, comprehensive natural database that I think is 100, 125 or so. The Linus Pauling Institute is free. For research drugs, if you're interested in drugs and research, alzforum.org is a very good site for that. I'll give you a couple sites on complementary medicine there. And there's a couple of papers, uh, articles that have been done actually by the California State Board of Pharmacy. So with that, I leave you with this. There are many wonderful new drugs out there to be discovered, and they're in our forest. Let's help protect them. Thank you. So I'm sorry, the question was, what is ginseng? Ginse ginseng is a, is a natural plant product, herbal use in traditional uh, Asian medicine, more as a routine tonic to be used every day, uh, not so much to take for a specific condition, although it is used, as all herbals are, just about for a number of conditions. But there are different types of ginseng. Some have different alkaloids in them. So I would refer you to that consumerlab.com, uh, which has a lot of information that basically is free uh, about products like ginseng. But nitrosamines are additives, right? You're talking about preservatives? Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, I'm, I, my personal opinion is I'm not in favor of, of additives or preservatives in my food. Because I don't think, I mean, chemicals, I look at the body as I used to study uh, marine biology, uh, and I think of it as a situation where I change something in a stream up at the head of the stream, and I'm looking to see what happens, what all the impacts are downstream. And that's how I think of drugs. So the fewer things I have going on there, um, I, the, the happier I am. Okay, I think the safer you are. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, so is ginseng on uh, Dr. Oz, actually? Dr. Oz. <laughs> wow, Dr. Oz. You don't want me to go there. I have a problem. I just have a problem. I mean, some people really do really good work on TV and radio, but gosh, sometimes I just cringe. <laughs> Maybe I should do I think, well, I should have done that. Yeah. There is a product my, uh, the man that I care for takes called Juvenon. Any comments about that? Juvenon? Juvenon, yeah. Juvenon was developed by a couple of uh, researchers, chemists over at UC Berkeley. Yeah, Juvenon is lipoic acid and um, was it L-carnitine, I think. I got that right? Yeah. Uh, I honestly don't know that I've seen really no substantial studies to support that it's effective in improving memory or treating Alzheimer's disease. Uh, however, I don't think, my own opinion is, I don't think there are any adverse effects. I think there's no harm in trying it if, you, if someone wants to. It's important to let your physician, again, 
uh, know, you know, that he's taking it, okay? And that's one of the things to look for, even with the prescription drugs, is it making any difference? And if it's not, uh, you want to talk to your physician about should it be continued? Sometimes making a difference, though, is just not changing with the prescription drugs. Well, the, the question was about uh, positive science in, in specific, but uh, I guess the game training in, in general. I, I think we're still at a really early phase. Positive science has done a really fine job of starting research in this field. Um, it's not done by many companies uh, that sell products. So I think they should be applauded on that. I think that, that it is the direction that all companies should move in as much as possible into documenting what are the benefits because you know they're not free and you don't have as all the time in the world to do them. So there is some beneficial uh, uh, findings from that from that group uh, about some of their uh, interventions and I still think we're really at the beginning stage in understanding exactly what is best and what works for one person as far as preventing memory loss is really not much of that uh, for any company. So you know I urge you to use caution and, and be a smart consumer with any of these products. Uh, I think that the concept behind them is very good and, and I believe in it. I believe that our brains do have this remarkable ability to modify and improve itself throughout our lives. So we're, we're still at the beginning uh, of figuring it out and, and what I hope will happen over the next 10 years or even sooner is that we start picking out which of these type of training uh, programs work best for what person and give you more data that maybe is more equivalent to what we are, have come to expect from the pharmaceutical industry so we can make really informed decisions. So, you know, I think for the most part we'll probably find that a lot of these are not harmful. Uh, so if you enjoy doing them, they're probably all right to do. And how much benefit they'll have to you is something that we'll hopefully learn a lot more about. The question was uh, statins, like, le like lovastatin, atorvastatin, these are cholesterol-lowering drugs, might have some adverse effect on memory. Th this is actually a story that's been around for a long time. Um, there are some people that have reported uh, increased confusion, uh, more than probably memory loss per se, uh, on the statins. It's very episodic. It doesn't seem related to any particular statin. And frankly, it's been hard to pin down that there's really a cause and effect between a, a statin and that problem. What has unfortunately been shown, because statins were thought, there was one, uh, a torvastatin was in clinical trials to see if it would reduce the risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, and that study unfortunately just failed. So statins also have been thought that they might actually be beneficial. Um, but does that answer your question? Yeah. The question was, uh, the benefits of, of riding on a motorcycle is similar to what I described in terms of immersive, uh, multitasking, lots of things going on. And it's true in a lot of ways that uh, many of the things that I've described that and, and, and that we both described that keep your brain healthy in terms of mental activity are things that a lot of them you could do in your in your daily lives if you choose to. I mean, things like travel uh, where you really engage in, in lots of things uh, that, that challenge your, your, your thinking. Um, step, I guess one thing that I like to describe is sort of stepping outside of your comfort zone. I think we spend so much of our lives trying to become comfortable, uh, which is fine, but we know that our brain doesn't do well with comfort. It likes challenge, and that's probably a lot of what stimulates its development throughout our, our younger years. And I think that it's okay to be uncomfortable sometimes and challenge yourselves. Uh, I think we still need a lot more data on this, but it's certainly something that we can extrapolate out from the information that we have that this is a, a, a healthy way uh, to, to behave in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, sure, driving, you know, a motorcycle despite its potential uh, side effects that are <laughs> negative <laughs> probably stimulates your brain in a lot of ways as well. Uh, I think where these training programs will have a benefit is that they constantly challenge you. So a, a, a well-designed training program is adaptive. So some people will ask me, well, you, des you design this car driving game. I'm like, I already drive a car. What do I need that game? And the, the element is that very often we find shortcuts in our regular daily routines to make things easier for ourselves. And how these programs are supposed to work is 
that they're the opposite of that. As you get better, they get harder and they keep challenging you and pushing you. And usually in our lives, we figure out the ways to get get away with a little less. So that's why the training programs have a particular little benefit and might help. But the general point is that it's the stimulation of your brain that you can and should do in your regular lives, you know, largely are, are things that you might do anyway. We expect to have a real benefit. We need more studies on that. But it's definitely the impression of many people that that is the type of thing that keeps your brain healthy. Sure, yeah, this is a really interesting outcome, and it's something that's been shown um, in many other studies as well. So these individuals' brains upon autopsy had signs of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, but they weren't showing any symptoms. And like you mentioned, it was including places like your hippocampus, which are important for memory. So you know, the question is sort of, if we know these structures are important for memory, then why aren't we seeing these changes in everyday life? And so that's sort of why theories like cognitive reserve came about. And I didn't get into too many examples of it, but part of the theory is that you may be able to use what you have left more efficiently than someone else, or you may be able to use different strategies. So it's more about the function of your brain than the structure of it. So for example, if you are really good at something, like you're really good at uh, building furniture, and you start to have some changes in your brain that might affect uh, your capacity to do that, you probably have done it a while, done it long enough that you know flexibly how to use different tools, different ways to, to shape the wood that someone else might not. And so that's part of what it's getting at is that it's not that you don't have those changes, is that you're more efficiently using what you have than someone else. I'm sorry, you asked what's being measured, tests being measured? Yeah, so it's sort of a murky area. I mean, I think the, what we've used right now are things that are not great, which are like IQ, educational attainment. I think we're branching more out into areas like uh, leisure activities. So I mentioned briefly things that we call like intellectually engaging leisure activities, socially engaging leisure activities. I think in research we're trying to sort of delineate that more in addition to looking at cognitive training to see what cognitive reserve really entails. Because we've seen this correlation where if you have higher education, you seem to have what we call higher reserve and more ability to sort of stave off these issues. Well, I think that's something that is, is, again, it's still preliminary evidence. I think what I have read more about is people can still benefit from things like physical exercise when you have mild cardiac impairment. And that, again, doing things that are intellectually engaging but not stressful. And so if you have these cognitive difficulties, I wouldn't suggest telling a loved one to do, you know, do puzzles and puzzles if that's something they don't enjoy. You know, if it's something that's actually stressful to them, then it's probably not going to help. Because like I mentioned, stress, mood, all of that also affects your thinking. So um, what she asked was, you know, her loved one doesn't like to do physical exercise and doesn't like puzzles, so could she give her something that would sort of enhance her mood, so a pill? <laughs> and I'll step away. Let, let, let me comment on that because in, in Alzheimer's, at least, Frank, Alzheimer's disease, uh, it's not only the acetylcholine deficit, that neurotransmitter, also there's a decline in something called serotonin. And uh, in some individuals, upping the serotonin levels actually is a way to treat depression. So it's not something, that I think, to be o overlooked when we say a mood enhancer, something like that. So the question was, does everything we were talking about tonight also apply to things like frontotemporal dementia, which was discussed in earlier sessions? So we mainly talked about healthy aging and Alzheimer's disease. Um, for my part of it, I can say that there have not been a lot of studies looking at frontal temporal dementia um, and cognitive reserve for exercise. Um, there are more studies looking at sort of those intermediary things like inflammation and frontal temporal dementia, which is an association there. But, um, you know, that, that's something that is not, I don't even know if you call it its infancy. It's, it's really in the beginning stages in terms of understanding that. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the question about frontal temporal dementia touches on an area that just a few years ago we wouldn't have been discussing at all. So the one thing that where we have really advanced and, and we still have a ways to go is distinguishing in different types of dementias, one from the other. And the drugs that we use to treat Alzheimer's, the cholinesterase inhibitors, the Aricept, the Exelon, and 
actually tend to make some people with frontal temporal dementia worse. There are studies right now looking at Namenda or Mementine, in fact, we're doing several here, uh, to treat frontal temporal dementia, and we'll see how that works out because the damage in the brain is actually to a different, particularly a different protein. It's not the same as in Alzheimer's. None of the drugs that uh, today are approved for treating vascular dementia, however, there is some work that's been done that suggests that the Alzheimer's type of drugs may have some benefit. It's not quite clear, I think, how great that benefit is. The, the one area is, or the most important is early in the process, you know, of the disease is managing the cholesterol, blood pressure, and diabetes. Those are things, obviously, that can be done. So the question was that uh, when we talked about physical exercise helping with cognitive improvement, are there some individuals that uh, don't necessarily have cognitive improvement, so they might not have the same requirements of physical exercise? So, I mean, for, first of all, obviously, um, physical exercise have a large reaching impact beyond cognition as well. In terms of just the benefits on cognition, uh, for all of these things is the other complicating factor that we've glossed over, which are individual differences, um, which a lot of times are ignored, right? Because what you need for approval of a drug or even to get that big important publication is a population effect. But what we know in reality, if you look at the data that some individuals show great effects and some show less effects and that's something that we're becoming more interested in as a field. Some people refer to this as sort of customized medicine that there's information at the individual level that is often overlooked at the population level that's very important especially to individuals and so it's something that we take very seriously in our research now and we're trying to learn more about how we how we can predict on an individual basis who is going to have a better effect than others? This is something that we, we don't have not paid a lot of attention to as the medical community as, as a whole. So it's true that some people that might have the biggest impacts are those that need it the most, and others might not. But it doesn't mean that, that you would not have any type of sort of physical um, uh, requirements or, or that you might even get benefit from it. It just might be that there are different things that are helpful for you. So that's something that I hope that we become a lot more aggressive about is understanding how a person's own uh, individual makeup and the things that make them different are, are considerations and what they put into their treatment portfolio to make themselves healthier.